I'm Michael Cathcart. It's very nice to see so many of you on this chilly evening. Since our subject is history, it's particularly appropriate that we acknowledge tonight that we're in Bunjil country and pay our respects to the Kulin Nation. Every now and then a book comes along which becomes a building block of Australian culture. And we have a few biographies of this scale. David Marr's biography of Patrick White, Don Watson on the years he spent with Keating, and Hazel Rowley's Christina Stead. And now this, Mark McKenna's book, An Eye for Eternity, The Life of Manning Clark. Congratulations. Thanks, Michael. Thank it's you. wonderful. Um, I should say the reason I'm here is because in the early 90s I did an abridgment of Manning Clark. I spent two years in a room with Manning Clark. I always say I live with Manning Clark for the two years after he died. <laughs> and uh, it was a very intense experience. And in fact, the, the, the book we're here to discuss tonight has confirmed lots of the feelings I, I intuited about about the history, and uh, we'll come to those as, as the um, conversation unfolds. So you, you start the book, Mark, with his voice, mm. um, which was a, a, a powerful part of his presence. Well, when I talk to people about Manning, one of the things that they remembered most strongly was his voice. Um, many people said to me, of all the things about him that stay with me, his voice is the thing which I recall. And the voice, I went back and I listened to radio recordings and what struck me about the voice was this strange mixture of vulnerability and strength. So it was a very intimate delivery. It was a voice that drew you in. It was a voice that, that made you feel you wanted to hear more. Um, so it was the most memorable thing about him and that's why I chose to start the biography with that well, image of the voice. Also a voice of a man who's conscious of his performance. Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean... That's, that came across in some of the stories of, of uh, people who knew him and family members. You know. Did he have different voices for different occasions? Um, yes, well, I think he's a liar bird in a way. He steps in and out of character. He had a great talent for mimicry. He had a great talent for impersonation. So he's always darting in and out of character. So yeah. you, you say that he learnt at least one of these voices from his dad. Yes, that was the preacher's voice. Um, that was the stern voice. But um, his father was also a larrikin, so he could also mimic his father's uh, larrikin voice as well. Let, let's so. talk about his mum and dad, because mm -hmm. one of the accounts he gives of himself is that he's caught between two mighty opposing forces. Yeah. On the one hand, his mother's principle. Yeah. On the other hand, his father's principle. And that's what he's trying to sort out. Yeah. So can you talk to us about that? Sure. Well, he's, he's, um, on his, father, his father was from working-class London. And his, his grandmother, on his father's side, was a Protestant Irish from Tipperary. Uh, on his uh, mother's side, he was uh, descended from Samuel Marsden, of course, um, and also uh, from Victorian pastoralist uh, family. So Manning dramatised these two different sides of his family. Sort of patrician principle the on patrician the one side. patrician and the working class. Mm. So that was always one of the dramas that he played out and was one of the dramas that he lived in himself. And it's as if it seems to me that the patrician principle represents um, notions of high culture, of mm -hmm. discernment, of good taste. Yes. On the other hand, the working class principle is about life and vivacity and so on. Well, I think when Manning spoke to a public audience, it was usually the life and vivacity side that he, that he leaned to and played, and played to. Yeah. Mm. And, yet, and yet he's very close to his mother, eerily mm. close to his mother. Well, that's, I'm not so sure that he was close. He certainly adored her and she adored him. She was a very pious woman. She wasn't a woman, I think, who really knew him in his adulthood. Well, she was close to him. Um, I mean, she, close, she was. He wrote to her very frequently. But I think that he felt frustrated at times that she couldn't appreciate his new intellectual world, that she was removed from the sort of world that he was discovering in Oxford, for example. I love the fact that when he was in Oxford, she baked cakes in... And sent, men, them, and yeah, sent she, them to him. She baked cakes... Uh, She's baking and, cakes in Mentone and, and sent them off to Oxford. And sent as them, if you can't get a cake in England. Sent them all the way to, uh, to <laughs> Oxford. Um, I'm not sure what state they were in when they arrived, but, uh, but uh, no, she did do that. It is a strange thing, isn't it? Um, but, one, one of the things that's astonishing about him is that he visits his parents' grave mm. and writes little letters to them. It's like, it's like a sort of Chinese ritual. He, he leaves little letters there and, and then has one of the children photograph him after the event. Yeah. What's that all about? Well, that took some time to explain, I think. I mean, I was rifling through the papers one day and I found a blurry image of Manning standing next to his parents' gravestone uh, with a note attached to the gravestone. And then I found later the note in the papers which read something like, Dear Mum, Dear Dad, 
I wished you could have seen me today when I was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Melbourne, for example. One of the strange things that happens is that as Manning became more famous and, and better known, his relationship with his parents, who were then dead, of course, uh, changes. So as he becomes more heroic, as he becomes more of a public figure and celebrity, his, his memory of his parents also became more heroic. They became more godlike. And I guess it raised questions in my mind. Uh, I mean, it's about my own childhood, and I'm sure it would for anyone reading the book. How do our own memories of our childhood change over time? And how are they affected by the things we experience in our lives? How do our image of our parents, for example, change as we change? And for Manning, he certainly, he certainly turned his parents into literary godlike figures as he became himself more famous. In a, in a way, it was a way of, I think, wanting to prove to them as well that, that he, had, he had done good, as we say. Um, but it was also filmic because he asks his son to photograph himself. He pins the note on the gravestone and says, please take this photograph of me. So he's con and he leaves that in his papers. He's constantly he's documenting conscious, his own life, isn't he? He's conscious of who will come later and see that. He's conscious that that will be written about. And so it's a it's an extraordinary example. Going to show up, basically. Not only me, but many others. I'm you sure. You and Brian Matthews were going to show up. Yeah, well, there'll be more too, Michael. There'll be many more, I'm sure. I'm sure there will. When did he know that the history was going to be the work of his life? Quite early on. I mean, I discovered a letter in, written in 1938 when he was still at Oxford. Um, a really extraordinary letter because he just states to Dimfner, he's writing to his uh, fiancée at that time, and he writes to her, I'm convinced that one day I can write something on Australian history. No one, he says, has captured that sense of weirdness, that sense of melancholy about Australia. And I think I can do it. But in the same letter, he also admits... I'm not a scholar. Immediately, he thinks that he wants to be the artist. He wants to be the historian artist, not the scholarly historian. So from quite early on, in his early 20s, he's convinced that he wants to write Australian history. Now, it's not so long after he writes that letter, but he's come back to Australia by that stage and he's teaching at Geelong Grammar, mm -hmm. and he writes, the confession must be made that my motive is to impress vulgarly to play to the gallery. The gallery yeah. It will satisfy my ego, a word I expect we're going to use a fair bit in this discussion, to produce a work which will bring publicity to me. Mm. Well, that proved to be very prescient, didn't it? <laughs> I mean, uh, he certainly did achieve that. I mean, one of the things about Manning's history, I think, is that for those of us who, who lived through the time that it was written, is it's quite interesting to note, and this became clear as I was working on his papers, the actual writing of those histories became a serialised public drama. I mean, we followed, the media followed, the writing of Manning's histories. It was the effort, the struggle to complete those six volumes, which was in itself a story, mm. as well as what he produced. Um, and his audience, after all, was the broad Australian audience. It was, it was not the Academy. His audience was what he called the serious-minded Australian the serious-minded reader. In fact, he was oddly dismissive of the Academy. The Academy would suck at him. And that's one of the contradictions about his life that gets up the nose of many academics and uh, has for a long time, and that is because Manning often pilloried academics, uh, mocked them as dry, as measurers, whereas he was the person, of course, who could connect to a public audience. But, of course, this was a man who, who lived and traded on his authority as the first professor of Australian history. So he was a man who, who used and relied upon his academic authority, but also someone who distanced himself from the academy. So that, that's a tension in his own life, yeah. which, which does, uh, depending on where you sit there, inside the academy or outside. It all seems difficult to me to know to what extent he did connect with the Australian public. I mean, y y you write as though that connection was quite profound. Mm. But it's, it's an odd kind of connection. I mean, he, w when he's at the footy, for example, yeah. watching Carlton, mm. he behaves as though he's you know, one of the masses. But there he is, at the, you know, standing in the outer, a very strange figure indeed. Well, he's wearing a three-piece suit and a large Akubra hat. And he looks like a kind of 19th century preacher. There's another photograph, one of my favourite photographs of him. He's sitting on the, the hill at the Sydney 
Sydney cricket ground, surrounded by some of his uh, sons and, and a, a sort of bevy of beer-swilling males. And uh, there he is in his preacher's outfit, and they're sitting there in shorts and nothing much else, uh, drinking beer. He's so out of context, mm -hmm. um, but that was part of his intention. But why he connected with a public audience, I think, comes back to the voice as well. I mean, when I listened to his public um, recordings over and over again, what I found really striking was that he never talked down to his audience. He's always on the same level as his audience. So, for example, he'll say things like, I wonder if, he doesn't say I know, or he'll, I wonder if this is the answer. You may think, if I may be so bold, I mean, it sounds quite quaint now, but, but really he's placing himself on the level of his audience. He's not talking down to them. He's talking in a conversational tone. And I think that that was, that was one of his real talents as a speaker, connecting with his audience. Mm. He never talked down to them. He was never the expert. He was always the ponderer, the muser. And, and yet the, the role he's playing, I mean, it is a preacher, but it also is self-consciously academic, if you see what I mean. He is the kind of historian from central casting. He's got the long hair and the beard, and he looks like yeah. what you want an academic to look like, if you see yeah, what I mean. Yeah, although I think that now, if we, if we turned on our television screens tonight and we watched Late Line, and there was a man in a three-piece suit with a larger Kubra hat uh, pondering on Australia's future, I think he'd be laughed out of court. Uh, I think that Manning's character in the early 70s and 1980s was part of us as well. I think that we are responsible. We were responsible for Manning's creation as much as he, he but was. But also a degree of eccentricity so, in university life was expected then, whereas universities have become more corporate that's now. That's true, that's true. Uh, but I think that at the time, Australia wanted someone or needed someone to talk or point to their the word that was used always was identity, their future, who were we as a people? That was what Manning said was the main, the main task of his work, of his life's work, was to answer one question. Who were Australians? What were we about? Where were we heading? These were very simple questions, but these were ones that we were receptive to, I think, um, at that time, in a way that we're we're not quite receptive to in this in now in the same way. Also, I think we were more, more open to criticism. I think that that was a time in Australia's nationhood when we were open to, to questioning and pondering and criticism of ourselves in a way that now I think, especially post-history wars, that question I think has been, we're much more standing solidly behind a more conservative and more... Um, a less critical view of ourselves. We're not, I think in some ways, that, that period that Manning was most active in was much more open uh, to different suggestions than, than we are now. Let's talk a little about the journey that he went on mm. in order to become that public figure. Mm. Now, as you say in the book, really, he needs to be thought of as an artist. And yeah. you make the point that if you want to understand him, put him into a context, put him alongside Nolan and mm. uh, Patrick White. Really, yeah. they're the three musketeers. Yeah. Um, but l let's talk about his historical influences, because he does fit into some kind of historiography. Who, who are the historians that shape him? Well, firstly, Thomas Carlyle and Thomas Carlyle's history of the French Revolution, Edward Gibbon, Macaulay, the great grand narrative 19th century historians. These are the historians that really are his inspiration. But really, I mean, more than any historian, it's novelists. It's D.H. Lawrence, it's Dostoevsky, it's Patrick White. These are the figures which really... Um, uh, his inspiration and part of uh, that letter that I referred to earlier written in 1938 where I talked about the fact that he was he knew from his early 20s that he wanted to write Australian history in that letter he talks about the weird melancholy of Australia that's never really been written about now that's straight from D.H. Lawrence and it's straight from Marcus Clarke of course yep. and so it's it's about the metaphysical and existential dilemmas for Europeans in the Australian environment. That is what he is perplexed by, as Lawrence was, yeah? And what, let, let's so, talk about Dostoevsky as well, because yeah, sure. Dostoevsky haunts everything, it seems mm. to me. I mean, he, he goes mm. to the Soviet Union and partly in search of a, a kind of 
vision of Lenin, but also it seems to me he's looking for Dostoevsky. He's trying to retrace the steps of Dostoevsky. Who, who is the Dostoevsky that he knows? What does he represent oh, to Manning? Well, sure, uh, good question. I mean, first and foremost, uh, Dostoevsky was a fellow epileptic. I mean, Manning was an epileptic, and and uh, while whilst he didn't have any attacks, um, well, after his late twenties. Um, Dostoevsky was a fellow epileptic, so that was one source of identification. Dostoevsky also produced a fiction or a, a relig that had a religiosity that was ambiguous, that was open to doubt. And this, I think, was the biggest thing that drew Manning to him. Um, and Manning, I mean, Manning read every letter that Dostoevsky wrote as well as every novel. He reread the novels time and time again. It was like a, a, a kind of lodestar. For, 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 for his, whole, his whole creative life. So Dostoevsky, um, and, and also at times Manning's own life mimicked Dostoevsky, so that Manning often, he lived through literature to the point that literature was the most real reality. L literature was where, was where Manning, Manning just didn't read a novel. He actually stepped into it and, and lived through it. So he imitated characters' performances in novels. Um, in fact, David Malouf said to me once that he thought that the gravestone pilgrimages mirrored a poem by, I think, Auden about... Uh, but I haven't found the poem, and David couldn't find it either. But, but the idea being that perhaps somewhere in literature there's, there's an example of, of behaviour that Mami, Manning was mimicking. Mm. So this is really quite an extraordinary way to live. It's also it's a, completely at odds with the idea that Manning Clark is an ideologue, which is the, hmm. you know, the, what the history wars depicts him as. Oh, look, I think one of the tragedies of um, our understanding of Manning in the last, since he died, it's 20 years now since his death, we've primarily understood Manning's life through the prism of the culture wars in the last 20 years. So, you know, was Manning a communist? Was he, did he wear the Order of Lenin or did he not wear the Order of Lenin? I mean... This is the same Manning, remember. Uh, John Howard, for example, uh, launched, or not launched, but uh, spoke at the 50th anniversary of Quadrant uh, in 2006, as when he was Prime Minister. And in that speech, he, he, uh, he criticised Manning as being the communist sympathiser. Th now, the very journal he was there to commemorate the 50th anniversary of, when it began, who was on the editorial board? Yes. Manning Clark. Because Manning Clark in the 50s was seen as the new potential voice of an enlightened Australian conservatism. He was a man who was writing about the great themes of European civilisation, who would really explain the virtues of the civilisation we'd brought to Australia. And that's why he was seen by the likes of James Macaulay and Peter Coleman as a potential voice of Australian enlightened conservatism. These things have been completely forgotten. Well, it's, it's that he's wrestling with, with the alternatives, isn't he? And it's not, when I say alternatives, it's mm. not two. There are three or four ways in which a man might live yeah. in order to get to the truth at the bottom of things. And it was a time, we have to remember, this was a time when, peop when these ideological systems competed for people's allegiance in a way that they no longer do. And, and so... Manning, of course, was always interested in the space bet in between uh, commitment and doubt. So he always sat on the fence, as it were, whether it was to do with religious belief or whether it was to do with his political persuasion. But the idea of Manning as a communist, I mean, as Ian Hancock once said to me in Canberra, if Manning was a communist, now I know why the Soviet Union fell apart. I mean, um, Manning... Manning, A, A, Manning knew that this was a system of government which was atheistic, right? Yeah. Number one problem for Manning, being a communist. Number two, this was a system of government which subsumed the individual for the collective. Problem number two for Manning, the great individualist, okay? And Manning felt that the, the aspect of compulsion, of conformity, in the communist system was abhorrent. He's on record as saying that yeah, many and times. And he called Lenin yeah, Christ-like. He did. Ha, now, that's interesting. Good you mentioned that. Because this is often quoted. Manning said that Lenin was Christ-like. If you he did. <laughs> However, when you look... At, well, he said it twice. So the first time he said it was in Meeting Soviet Man. But in Meeting Soviet Man, which was published after his visit to the Soviet Union in the 1950s, he was talking about the Soviet's portrayal of Lenin as Christ-like. 
Uh -huh. Very, very important, crucial difference. He wasn't saying, I think Lenin is Christ-like. He was saying, quite rightly, that the Soviet depiction of Lenin was Christ-like. Mm. Okay, that's a, that's a very... Yes, I'm not convinced by that reading. You don't I have to be. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but on the second occasion, when he went to the Soviet Union in 1970 and made a speech there, that was where he did um, make those sorts of similar noises again. And I think, in retrospect, Manning himself knew that his work on the Soviet Union was naive. If for a start, the mere premise of the book, that you could go to a country for three weeks and then some, somehow sum it up after a three-week visit in which you were led around by Soviet um, officials, usually by the name of Vladimir. So. <laughs> Let's talk about Dimfna. There she is up there in her, her old age. Um, and there she is as a younger woman with uh, one, of the, one of the children. Um, you interviewed her. What, what story did she want you to tell? Well, firstly, I interviewed... I didn't really... I spoke, I was, she was a friend, and she died before I decided to take this biography on. So right. I, I didn't really interview her formally for the biography, although I spoke many times with her about Manning. I mean, Dimfna... Well, I should explain... Writing the biography, I had access to over 53 years of private correspondence between Manning and Dimfner. So that in itself is quite an unusual degree of access to have with any couple uh, over five decades of marriage. This was correspondence that the children themselves have not read, or if they have read, they've only read some of it. So I was privy to, to material which the family themselves often hadn't read in its entirety, and that was a strange position to be in. Some of this correspondence Manning had marked quite clearly to be destroyed after my death. And Dimfner chose not to destroy it. Mind you, you could also say of Manning, rather than write on a folder to be destroyed after my death, just do it. <laughs> if you really want it to be destroyed, right. just do it. Don't give instructions. I mean, again, it's a dramatic... Yeah, yeah, so, so. so Manning left a note, as he, of course, he's always leaving notes. Um, Dimfner didn't follow those instructions, in part, I think, because she wanted that story to be told. She didn't destroy those documents because many of those documents were her voice. They were her letters, and she wanted those those aspects of their marriage told through two voices rather than just through Manning's. Because let's remember that um, when Manning spoke about his marriage in public, it was always Manning who represented, who was the storyteller. Mm. And I think the correspondence allows Dimfner to also be the storyteller. But one of the most difficult things that she had to go through was at the end of her life when the diaries were when she read Manning's diaries. She had to read over five decades of material which was predominantly extremely negative about her and often hurtful and critical. Very, very few... When you say negative, he's impatient with his wife. Why does my wife not understand no, no, me? No, no, more than that. No, no, no. Not just impatient, but actually, you know, at times abusive. Yeah. Yeah? So it goes beyond just impatience. Um, because... The, this, the diary for Manning was like shedding skin. The diary was a place where he dumped all of his negative feelings about his wife, about his children, about life in general. So the, the diary is dark and despairing. And she had to read through those diaries for the first time two years after he died. And sometimes you'll find markings in the diaries where she herself has has expressed surprise or exclamation that something's not mentioned or so but she again could have destroyed those and she chose not to they went to the national so library so he's leaving notes to you or to yep. the biographers who will follow and she is as well she left a, she left a very detached librarian like note saying explaining where the material had been found in the house and why she was going to leave it behind um, but the family sold all the papers or to the National Library when, while Manning was still alive, but they held back the private correspondence between Manning and Dimfner, which was what I read in Manning's study. And that was also quite 
and experience to read that correspondence sitting in the room where he wrote many of those letters and wrote his life's work. So he must have reflected on what his motive is because the man that you've created is a man who is not the heroic figure that he, that he, that he struck, if you see yeah, what I mean. Well, it's well, a much more flawed character. Yeah. and a, a man you feel inclined as a reader to judge um, pretty harshly. Well, I can see why you might at times come to that conclusion. Um, I mean, when I first saw Manning's papers and I saw some of the, the headings on the boxes, you know, comments on my work, my great friends. Uh, so Manning's very headings for the, for the archive were themselves sort of leading, leading you along certain paths. Um, but I think that there was also a great... Um, burden about this degree of self-consciousness that he had. I mean, Manning lived to be remembered. He wanted his story told in a way that I think few other people actually want their life story told. He laid, he wrote everything down. He kept everything. He wanted the biographer so much that he directed the biographer about how to interpret certain individuals or, or what notes to, to look for. So you can, you can view that as being extremely egotistical and self-centred, etc., which in part it is, but it's also a handing over. It's also a giving over of his life in a way that I think few of us would dare countenance. Most of us would prefer our privacy. Uh, most of us would not hand over so much of our lives for posterity, and he did. The fact that he wanted his story told is really one of the, the most interesting things about him as a biographical subject. Let's continue to explore the way in which you wrote the biography uh, but in a moment, but talk a bit more about him and this issue of ego because it goes to the heart of understanding what the great work of History of Australia is, it seems to me. Mm. Um, so I guess the, the key question really for you is, well, what is it? Uh, I mean, it seems to me it's a deeply misunderstood work, with good reason, because it's, it's published by an august university press. It's, it's presented in the very scholarly format, a history of Australia, volumes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. You'd expect it to be a kind of definitive, if there could be such a thing, mm. account of Australian history. But it's something very, very strange, in fact. It is strange. I mean, on, look, on one level, it was passe when it began. I mean, volume one's published in 1962. It's a multi-volume, epic, uh, romantic, narrative-driven history of Australia. Um, midway through the project in the 1970s, it's definitely passe in terms of the history that's being written at the time. But in other ways, it's very creative and it's extremely, I think, uh, ahead, of, ahead of its time. Well, you take, for example, Manning's writing about place, the way that he really wanted to understand what it was like for Europeans in this strange, ancient Australian environment. The, the Australia that Lawrence said civilization was just sprinkled over the surface and nothing had entered in in the way that it had entered in in Europe. So Manning had a sensitivity to the Australian environment. He had a sensitivity to sound. He wrote about a governor's ball in Tasmania, talking about the lap, lap, lap of the waters of the Derwent River. Mm. You saw the sc scar on William Bly's cheek. You, you were taken into the emotions of, of historical characters. Often, mind you, those emotions are Manning's written into his characters, but still, he wrote about the emotional lives. We've just recently had a centre created in Australia, funded by the federal government, a centre for the history of emotions. Well, if you want a pathbreaker in historical writing for writing about the emotional lives of characters in the past, Manning Clark is, is the person to look to. So it's a mixture. It is, but the question you then are faced with as you read the history is to what extent is this a history of Australia and to what extent is this an exploration of his own struggles, his own quest ultimately for immortality, his own quest mm -hmm. to be death, really, which, as I read your book, is is one of the prime drivers in him, that he's really looking for a way to, um, you know, cheat death. And you know, in, in that first volume, he sets up this proposition 
that there are three great forces that shape Australian history, Protestantism, Catholicism, Catholicism and the Enlightenment, um, a, a tripartite structure he has to abandon because, of course, there are many more factors that and they shape o- Australia. They overlap all yeah, the time. Yeah, and, we know, and who knows what the Enlightenment means? I mean, he just wheels that in That's whenever right. there's someone who's, mm. who's, who's a good thing but doesn't believe in God, they become the Enlightenment. But those struggles are within him, of course. Well, well isn't that the point? That the, the, three great, the three great forces that are struggling for supremacy... Uh, uh, Protestantism, Catholicism, Enlightenment are working in Manning Clark. I mean, it's, it's an odd idea that they're the forces that shape Australia. It's a very secular country, even in the 19th century, when people who go to church. It's, True. It, no, no, they're certainly forces that they are. It is his own inner conflicts writ large, if you like. But I think that, you know, why we have to ask ourselves, why do we go to Manning Clark? Why would we pick up Manning Clark's six volumes? Well, I think you go to Clark because, for insight, you go to Manning for insight. But not for information, not to check the facts. You don't go to Manning to look up historical dates or no. factual... Because he got them wrong. But he did get them wrong often. He did get them wrong because the way he worked often... You, rem- you have to imagine, if you think of Manning sitting at his study desk and he's got all the primary sources laid out in front of him. The best way I thought of describing this is like a pianist who sits down with a Beethoven or Schubert score and then improvises on the score. So the words in the primary sources mix with Manning's own voice in a way that's often difficult to separate. So it is creative, it is artistic, but it's not factually reliable. (laughs) But it's also tremendously insightful so often. I mean, some of Manning's greatest set pieces, the Burke and Will story, um, Gallipoli, um, his best mode was tragedy. Tragedy and comedy, perhaps, um, which often were, were closely connected. But I reckon the Burke and Will story is the high point, I actually. I think so. I that, think you know, if you could chart, as he learns in Volume 1, he tries a bit hard in Volume 1 yeah. to strike a kind of figure. Mm-hmm. And then he really has got it, absolutely. Mm. He's in... Can I just read you a little bit? I sure. reckon this is, the, this is the absolute high point of the work. Um, this, is, this is Wills. I think to live about four or five days, that's... He's quoting Wills. Wills writing to his um, father, isn't it? He's leaving a letter for his father. I think to live about four or five days. My religious views are not the least changed, and I have not the slightest fear of their being so. My spirits are excellent. That's the end of the quote. And Manning says... Within a day or so of writing those words, he died. A fine son of humanist civilization, a man with a dream of glory and a great delight in life, faced the silence with a nobility that transfigured the sandy waste in which he lay into a mausoleum fit for a hero. You feel like applauding. I mean, it's, it, it is a fantastic it's, it's wonderful. moment, isn't it? It's wonderful. Mm. And there are, there are other moments similar to that, but I think that is the high point. I agree. What do you point. make of the fact that there are these moments where you can sense that in the history he's revealing how his relationship with Dimpfner is going? For example, he writes about the Bushman who is, quote, tormented by guilt at what had come up from inside him and asked the women to forgive him and then hated her all the more yeah. as the one who knew what he was like. Well, that- that, that mirrors, that mirrors uh, many of Manning's descriptions of, of, of struggles with Dimfner in his diary. Yeah. It's straight out of the diary. See, when I was doing the so, abridgment, I kept coming across these things, and it was the first time I, I struck one, I thought, that, that's odd. What a str- How does he know that? Yeah. And then I get the second one, I thought, oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. And oh, the course. more, you know, you get, you know such, such and such is wrestling with the black bottle, that is alcohol, I thought, oh, I see, you've had a night on the turps. I mean, of course, uh, many uh, uh, women uh, find some of those, uh, you know, depictions uh, offensive because they see that it's always the men who have the great spiritual and dramatic inner struggles and the women are there, are there as sources of relief or sources of comfort. Um, they're never themselves um, historical actors with the same sorts of dramatic and grand inner conflicts as Manning gives to his male characters. So, I mean, um, he doesn't often win many points from, from uh, historians who are you know, coming from the aspect of gender. We'll just go through some of these pictures because we've actually lost our track here. Well, That's there, one there of my p- favourites because uh, this is a picture of Manning in Dublin in 1956 and to me it's a, it's a wonderful image of the colonial, this sort of part Baza McKenzie <laughs> um, 
uh, and uh, the, the suit, actually, he had the suit uh, made for him in India on his way to Dublin. Um, but I think I'll say no more than it that. It was ripped off, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't quite fit. And this is, um, the... this is um, a double page spread from, from Manning's diary. And um, I think you can see from this image, actually, one of the, the comparisons that was made by uh, one of the people who had to grapple with his handwriting long before I got there was that it was like micro barbed wire. Well, you can see how... No, I cannot read I... a single word of that. I well, mean, well, um, what does it say? J.M.W. Turner. The, the, the latter, a woman dressed in white, yellow hair, is looking to... So you sound like a third form student. I mean, the... <laughs> so this is the pace I moved at. For... You see why it took me so long. <laughs> Let's talk about those three musketeers, Nolan, Patrick White and Manning Clark. Mm. I mean, you make the point that they are a kind of trio. Mm. What is it that they share? Well, first and foremost, they all share the influence of D.H. Lawrence and Dostoevsky. They were all reading Lawrence and Dostoevsky. They were all trying to capture what they believed was a spirit of place. That's Lawrence's phrase, in fact. Um, there's a moment in 1949-50 when Sidney Nolan exhibits his paintings of Central Australia in Sydney. Manning and Patrick White both see those that exhibition unbeknownst to one another. Um, they're both taken by Nolan's uh, attempt to try and capture the centre of the of the continent. Um, and also, of course, Sidney Nolan himself is on record as saying once he got into the Kelly series, for example, that he was, he described his own work as history paintings. Nolan was painting history. Manning was depicting history in a painterly way. Yeah. Um, Manning takes his notebooks into the environment as a painter takes an easel into the environment. And also, interestingly, Kelly is a sort of surrogate for Nolan as yes, well as being that's Kelly. that's right, in, in a way that uh, Manning's characters are also for him in the history. And Patrick White, of course, was the person, the figure, the writer who Manning looked up to more than any other Australian writer because even before he won the Nobel Prize, um, he wrote to him after reading his novels on every occasion. They exchanged recordings of Bach's well-tempered clavier. Um, they, were, they were deeply impressed with one another's work from the early 60s on. And there's a correspondence from the early 60s right through to the 19. 90s, early 1990s when Manning dies. So that relationship, of course, soured at the end. I mean, I can talk about that if you want, but it's, it's one that flowered initially in the 1960s. And, of course, Sidney Nolan was a lifetime friend as well. White has a sort of resentment about Australia, though, I, I detect, which Manning didn't have. That was part of the reason, I think, that Manning and Patrick uh, became more distant from one another. Manning wrote down somewhere, I can't recall where, that Patrick hates Australia. Patrick has contempt for Australians. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that, but, but I can see why you'd come to that conclusion. Um, it, was, it was White's hatred of Australian materialism, of what he called uh, the, the, well, the tinny culture, the kind of suburban materialist culture, which he... It was a stereotype, too. And Manning, of course, identified with those people that White, he thought Patrick was treating with contempt. So on the other hand, this was the writer who had won a Nobel Prize. This was the writer who had a court, if you like, at his private residence in, in Centennial Park in Sydney. And Manning was desperate to be part of Patrick White's court, desperate, desperate for Patrick's approval. In, I think by the end of his life, in quite a, uh, a sad way, he Patrick White cut Manning. He refused to talk to him at, towards the end of his life because he thought Manning had sold out. Manning had played to the public gallery too many times and he refused to talk to him on that basis. But when Patrick died, who was it that you know, gave the public rights for, for, Manning's pass, for Patrick's passing? It was Manning. He was the one who the ABC turned to. They flew choppers down to Wapingo on the south coast of New South Wales Manning walked down the, off the steps of the veranda. Their holiday house. Yeah, their holiday house, and delivered this wonderful oration uh, to the ABC about the importance of Patrick White at the very moment when White had refused to speak to him and had told him he was nothing more than a vain uh, person who, who, who had sold out. So, but despite that, he managed to 
to do that for Patrick? This time we've got together is speeding by and uh, we must of course talk about the Kristallnacht mm. story. Now, um, I guess most of us know this, but the, just to fill you in, Manning often claimed that he was in Bonn on the morning of the 10th of November 1938, the morning after Kristallnacht. In fact, he was in Oxford and he arrived in Bonn two weeks later. It was Dimfner, who was then his fiancée, who was studying in Bonn, who saw the aftermath of Kristallnacht. And, um, and yet, for the rest of his life, he told the story about how he had gone there to visit Dimfner. They had seen the devastation. He'd seen the devastation with his own eyes. He placed them, placed himself in this historical event, mm -hmm. and it was a kind of turning point for him. Yeah, that's right. He saw the glass on the streets. He saw the synagogues burning. Uh, he arrived the morning after Kristallnacht, and this was a story that for him was a revelation because it revealed the capacity of human beings for evil and it showed him also the importance of history in understanding the human condition. Now, he tells that story repeatedly in the last 15 to 20 years of his life. And of course, what I discovered some time ago now, three years ago, because the essay was published in the monthly in 2000... And you, you published an essay about this in the that's monthly. That's right, I did. Yeah. Um, which. I, I was sitting in Manning's study one evening and uh, reading the letters between Manning and Dimfner in Oxford. While well, Manning was in Oxford, she was in Bonn. One of the letters I opened was from Dimfner describing the events after Kristallnacht. And then suddenly I realised he wasn't there. And of course, for me, as a teenager in my early 20s, I heard that story many, many times on radio. It was one of the most powerful stories he told. It drew me to him. And at that very moment, I felt angry and surprised because I realised, oh, you weren't there, you weren't there. After all those times you said that, you weren't there. But then, of course, I started to question, well, how, con how can I know, how can I know, how can I hear his inner voice? Do I know that he knew he wasn't there? Or did he merely appropriate Dimfner's memory of, of I mean, Dimfner's it presence? It comes back to this issue, doesn't so, it? That we, accept that we accept that artists lie. That's what artists do. They, they make things up. Mm -hmm. But a historian's contract with his audience is to tell the truth. And he breaks that contract. He does so long as we know that he knew he was lying. Okay, now and that, I'm, no, this is important. It's easy to assume Manning was lying. But I think if you think about it carefully, you'll see that it's quite possible that he had convinced himself that he was there, that he had, we all know in long relationships that you, you know, it's possible to Oh, we were there at this, we, were, we saw this together, we did this together. No, no, you weren't there. Or, oh, yes, I was. So these sorts of... We're not talking about like, a movie here no, or we're somebody's party. Christina. We're talking about crystal okay. art. We are, we are. <laughs> um, but for me, as a biographer and a historian, I mean, biography is not a court-martial. It's not a trial. It's not a case where I place Manning in the wit witness box and I then condemn him well, then or, why did or you, I close the book on him. Then why did you release this information in 2007? Because it put him in a very bad light. In 2007, well, you wrote an article in mm, which this, mm, you announced that you would, the yeah. world discovered that you were working on this project. That's right. And you, mm. you arrived on the world with this evidence that Manning Clark had lied. And that was the headlines that went with it. That, that was the way it was construed. The well, the you should have known that. You ended the, the media debate with well, the... Well, yes, yeah. No, I, I did have an inkling that that might happen. Um, but I, I, it was the most powerful thing for me at that time, in the early stage of the project, that really got fired my imagination. And I wanted to go out with it in public um, because I got an enormous feedback from that too. By putting it out there, I got incre... And all sorts of people got in touch with me who wanted to tell me about their stories about Manning, not necessarily even related to Kristallnacht. So I think the value of putting it out there, I don't regret putting it out there. It also let people know I was doing this biography. Um, and of course, since then, there's one crucial ingredient to the story, which I've discovered since that essay was published, and that was finding or being given a cassette tape with Dimfner's voice. And Dimfner says, this is after Manning's death, 
Manning said he arrived the morning after Kristallnacht. That's not true. I was there. Mm. Okay. Now, according to Sebastian, Manning's eldest son, he believes that Dimfner's loyalty to Manning was so unswerving that she never, despite the fact she, she had to listen to him telling that story, and we now know she, she knew the difference. She knew that he was wrong. Sebastian believes that she didn't confront him about it, that she kept quiet. Mm. What kept her in that marriage? Because as we learned from your biography, she left several times. We know from your book that he was unfaithful to her several times. Mm. Um, she often got impatient with him writing to her with these really overblown professions of love when she was absent. She said, for heaven's sake, stop talking like this. It's ridiculous. Um, well, I think, you know, she had to grapple from her very early 20s when they were courting. There's a wonderful story where she, she's at a lecture, uh, you know, German language lecture, and she cycles back to her apartment in Bonn, and there's not one letter from Manning waiting for her. There's not two. There's not three. There's about seven, and they're all piled, and they've been written in the last 24, 48 hours. And this outpouring of... Um, intense emotional neediness from Manning. She had to live with that throughout the five, and it never abated. I mean, right through the marriage, those letters keep that romantic headiness, that intensity. Um, but of course, her way of under expressing love was much more grounded in the everyday. Um, and she couldn't write the same letters in return. She couldn't reply to him with the same level of of uh, romantic neediness. So this was a, an unresolved problem right throughout. It was there from the beginning and it never, ever um, changed. However, you asked, what did she, what did she get yeah. from this marriage? I think, firstly, she had an extraordinary life through her connection with Manning, a rich life. She met all manner of people that she might not have met if she wasn't connected and married to, Mary, to Manning. And the other thing I think that drew her back was she was part of this epic project. She was integral to the successful completion of a history of Australia. She was from the beginning Manning's research assistant, his editor, his sounding board. She was his first reader. She was part of a history of Australia so much so that one of the things that brought her back to him time and time again was that I think she thought he, he might not have been able to complete that without her. And she was just as committed to that project as he was. And it's pretty clear that he couldn't have. I don't think so. No. I don't think he could have. Yeah. You, you quote the American writer Janet Malcolm, who said biography is, quote, the medium through which the remaining secrets of the famous dead are taken from them and dumped out in full view of the world. Did you ever feel that there were some secrets that you should keep? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suddenly I realised that line of questioning is going nowhere, is it? <laughs> Are there any secrets that you've revealed that you've had second thoughts about revealing? Because this, this must have hurt people, this book, people who are close to the family or who are in the family? And that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of things that I felt uncomfortable about revealing. The thing I kept coming back to was that it wasn't my decision to make these things available. The thing I kept coming back to was that Manning was the person who wanted his story told regardless of the cost to his friends, and I think to his family. His story mattered above all of that. I'm the messenger. There were things that I read about the children or about the grandchildren that I simply didn't put in because it was it, it, clearly I wasn't going to put those in because they'd be too hurtful to people alive. But there wasn't much that I didn't put in. Um, this is the drama in the story. 
this is the this is the anchor of the story this, the the biography of the marriage the and Manning's inner struggle Manning's need for for public enthusiasm and, and public endorsement Manning's need to connect with an audience Manning's need to have his life elevated to a level where the whole country wants to read about that story I feel privileged to have had that opportunity but that doesn't mean that at times I also haven't felt some elements of discomfort especially in terms of putting myself in the shoes of the family and thinking how would it feel for me to read this if I hadn't read it before mm. and that's something that, that they are going through now. Yeah, I bet they are. Let, let's, let's wind up by just reflecting on his achievement. I mean, you, you describe a conspiracy of silence within the academy of people who had misgivings about the work, especially the later work. I mean, uh, my own view is that volumes five and six are, are spirited polemics by a man who's disillusioned by the dismissal of the Whitlam government. And we end up with this polar world in which there is good and evil yeah. fighting each other, and good is basically Gough Whitlam, and evil is basically the Liberal Party. The, uh, the young tree green and the old tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he actually has a binary word yeah, for the young tree green true. and the old. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so that, that notion that had, that had animated volumes one to four are these great forces mm. of civilization all contending mm. for, for human destiny, that's, that's gone. And now there's a famous man. Uh, taking sides and mm. I think that's because the dismissal of the Whitlam government to which Manning was so closely identified and connected from the moment that Whitlam was elected in 72 I mean Manning and Patrick White are the people who are up on the public stage who are who are uh, advocating a vote for the Whitlam government. Yep. We hadn't seen this kind of connection between intellectuals and, and politicians in the well, way we saw Of course, Whitlam resolves that tension we started with. He's the patrician who was a man of the people. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And I think that when Whitlam was dismissed, that coloured, because of Manning's public role as a Republican and condemning the dismissal, that also coloured his work and changed the direction of his work. Um, and it be, did become more simplistic, I think, in the later volumes. Um, but Manning's commitment to, to that question about Australia's future, I think, is also admirable. If you think, again, of the sheer energy and commitment it takes to go out time and time again and speak publicly on all manner of platforms, school fates, school speech nights, the ABC, uh, public rallies, Manning always gave his time to questions about the country's direction and future, and I think that's an admirable, admirable aspect and trait. Do you feel you know him? I know him too well. Do you like him? Let me answer that this way. After all of the... Uh, this is not in the book. <laughs> After all of the time spent writing and researching the book, very close to the end, just before I sent the manuscript off, I came across a photograph, just by accident, of Manning's last public performance, two weeks before he died. He was in Launceston, addressing a small historical society meeting. It was a really unusual photograph at that time of his life because it caught him unawares. He wasn't playing to the camera. He was just caught at a very, very human moment and he looked very happy. He looked unusually happy <laughs> for that time of his life. And at that point, when I saw that photograph, I thought to myself, I still feel extraordinary affection for this man, despite everything mm. that I've gone through. So that's the way I'd answer the question. The, the, the phrase from Dostoevsky that resonates throughout his life is, I want to be there. You know, when we finally know what it's all been for. Did he die having discovered what it's all been for? No. No, he died in a way which was consistent with his whole life's approach, which was he died in doubt, he died uncertain, he died calling out for help. He did not die the death of a believer. Mm. He died the death of a man still unsure. He did not go gentle. No, he did not go gentle. No. The final image of the book is a beautiful one. Perhaps you could wind up just by sharing that with us. The final image of the book, the last paragraph, is uh, 
a story that was told to me by Anne Moyle, who's a historian in Canberra, who was a close friend of Manning's. And it was a story about her driving uphill in Canberra along Hobart or Melbourne Avenue um, late in the afternoon. Downhill, she caught sight of Manning and Dimfner in their car and she just caught sight of them at the moment that their heads were tilted back in laughter. They were sharing a moment of laughter. This was shortly before Manning died. That was the image I finish with because it's one of the questions I've grappled with as a biographer. Manning recorded the darkness, but he didn't often record it. And how do we record laughter? How do we record those moments? Correspondence often misses those moments, those unreachable moments of, of marriage and a relationship. And it was that moment of laughter between these two that in a way allowed Manning and Diffner to have the last laugh on me as well. Mm. Well, every now and then in life you have the privilege to read a book that, as you read it, you know is transforming you and will remain with you forever, and you've written such a book. Mark, uh, thank you for talking to us tonight, and thanks. thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mark.